Well, it has been a good morning so far. At 9 o'clock, we had three baptisms at the 9 o'clock uh, worship service, and so we're excited about that and uh, excited uh, that you guys are with us this morning. I, I just want to tell you this story. It's one of my favorite stories in in the book of Acts. Uh, We're here in Acts chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 12. That's just Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in your New Testament. We're in chapter 12. You you maybe remember Luke is the author of Acts and he's just just gotten started on kind of the next chapter, the next uh, avenue that he's going to explore in the book of Acts. Last week we talked about the planning of the church in Antioch and how it's really the start of, of sharing the gospel with the Gentile world. And, and, and Luke is, I, I know he has to be excited to share that story. He's going to be involved in some of the missionary journeys along with Paul. And so I'm sure he wants to kind of get to the part he played in the, in the story. And he, he wants to share that. But, but here in Acts chapter 12, he just has to kind of take a, a step back for a minute. He just has to... Uh, take us back to the the church in Jerusalem. And it's almost like, don't forget about these folks. And in Acts chapter 12, we get one last story, really, about the, the church in Jerusalem. And it doesn't start with a very, it starts, it's a sad story right away. Herod Agrippa is, is the king of the region. Agrippa is the great-grandson of, of Herod the Great, and, and uh, he, has, he has grown that kingdom again back to his grandfather's kind of glory, and, and he is the ultimate politician. He has perfected the art of, of keeping Rome happy. He grew up in the imperial palace in Rome, and, and so he has ties there, and, and he has influence there, and, and he's perfected the art of keeping that sort of side of the equation happy while also placating the the Jewish inhabitants of Judea and the area that he rules. One of the ways that he's he's kept the inhabitants of of Judea calm, the Jewish uh, uh, populace of of Judea calm, is that he's arrested some of the apostles. In fact, he didn't just arrest James. James is the brother of John. Maybe you remember reading some of the times when Jesus would go off with his 12 disciples, he'd take some a certain distance, and then he'd say, okay, I need to talk to kind of the inner crowd, right? And he'd take Peter, James, and John off a little bit further and, and have a conversation or, or do some really amazing things like they saw Moses and Elijah uh, transfigured. And so that's the James that we're talking about here in Acts chapter 12. And, and uh, Agrippa arrests James and then he has him beheaded. And this just enthuses the people. They're so excited about it. Uh, Herod is getting so much applause that he's just, I, I, I've got to keep this rolling. You know, I've got, to, I've got to do the next thing to kind of get another accolade, to get some more approval. And so he has, he has Peter arrested. And it's just at Passover. And so he's going to wait. He's just going to let Peter simmer in jail while uh, Passover, well, passes. And then he'll bring Peter out and he'll have a trial. And after that trial, he plans to execute Peter, I am very certain. And I think Peter knew that that was the fate in store for him as he's sitting in jail. And so it's kind of amazing to me that while he's sitting in jail waiting for this sham trial, waiting for his execution essentially, that he's asleep between two guards just snoozing away when an angel of the Lord shows up. Scripture says that the room shone, that it light filled the room, and, and that didn't wake Peter up. And I just imagine the angel saying, Peter! You know, he's, he's sleeping between two guards. There's a couple more guards at the gate. And Herod has, has spared no expense to make sure that his prize captive would be there in the morning. And so the angel said, Peter, Peter, Cephas, Simon, and still nothing. Peter is just snoozing away between these two uh, soldiers. And, and the angel literally has to take a stick and hit Peter with it in order to wake him up. 
And finally, Peter wakes up. And I'm not sure what's going on if Peter just hasn't rubbed the sleep from his eyes. But then the angel literally takes him by the hand. Peter, put on your sandals. Peter, put on your cloak. Peter, go ahead and stand up now. Peter, follow me. And he escorts Peter between those two guards. The shackles fall off. And he just walks out. He escorts, the angel escorts Peter between the next set of guards and out the prison gate and down the city block. And by the, by the time they get to the end of the block, Peter has sort of come to his senses and he realizes that I'm not in jail anymore. I'm not asleep. This isn't a dream. It's not a vision. God has really rescued me. And as he comes to his senses, he, he knows I need to go tell everybody else. And so he heads off to the house where he knows other believers will be and he pounds on the door and this young servant girl named Rhoda comes to the door and she says who is it and it's me Peter let me in she's so excited that she runs away turns runs back to the prayer meeting forgetting to open the door leaving the fugitive outside And she tells everybody in the prayer meeting, guess what? What's going on, Rhoda? Well, Peter is at the door. And they said, Rhoda, bless your heart. (laughs) They're from southern Judea. (laughs) Bless your heart. That's not Peter. It can't be Peter. Peter is in jail. She said, no, no, I'm sure it's Peter. They said, oh, maybe it's his guardian angel, and God is just trying to comfort you. We know he's taking care of Peter, but Peter's in jail. He can't be there. And all the while, there's just this banging on the gate. Bang, 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 bang. And finally, they, they decide, well, maybe we ought to see who's out there. And so they go to the door, and they open the door, and it's Peter, and it was like, Peter! Everybody's so excited, and Peter's like, shh, the police are after me. (laughs) Keep it quiet. And he tells them the whole tale. He tells them the whole story. This angel woke me up. I was having a good dream. I was sleeping well, and he hit me with a stick, and I woke up, and then I got dressed, and I walked out, and I finally realized God has really rescued me. He said, you need to tell James and the other brothers, wherever they're at, you need to tell them, and Peter takes off, probably to protect himself and to protect the church. He, I'm sure that he thought those soldiers that he had walked past, however miraculously, uh, would soon be after him again. And so he, he takes off and the, he leaves the church to, to spread the word that God really, he keeps his word, he rescued me. Well, we, we flash back at the end of our story to, to Agrippa who, who uh, summons for Peter the next day. And of course, the soldiers wake up from whatever trance or, or whatever they were in, however God kind of kept them silent and asleep. They, they come to realize, mm, no Peter, this is a bad deal. And it really was a bad deal because Agrippa finds out that Peter has escaped and he has those guards killed. He takes off as well. He goes to Caesarea, maybe to deal with some business, uh, some trade business, some political business that he has going on, maybe just to get out of town because now, you know, the applause has ended and people are like, look, this guy can't keep Peter in jail. And and so he flees and and, uh, pretty soon some people are going to say some nice things about Agrippa. And you you know, you even sound like a god. And Agrippa doesn't say, "Shh, shh, shh, he says, I think you're right. And God said, not so much. And the story for Agrippa ends poorly with him vomiting worms and dying. And it's terrible into his story. And the church, the church through this first state-sponsored persecution of the church just keeps rolling. God's word is expanded. And the church grows. I, it's one of my favorite stories because I, I could just see myself in that prayer meeting. You know, I would be the guy praying, oh, God, take, you know, take care of Peter, let him go. And, you know, Rhoda's like, hey, Lance, Peter's at the door. And I'm like, no, come on. Just hold your horses. 
God is really big, but he, you know, Peter's in jail. Calm down. It, sometimes it's just so hard for us to believe that our big, big God is really the big, big God that we serve. No matter how that early church, though, no matter the, the situations they faced, the hardships they encountered, no matter the, the kind of struggle they had even to exercise faith, just like we do today, no matter where they were at, the early churches, you read through the book of Acts, man, they, they do one thing when they encounter every sort of different situation. They pray. They are serious about prayer. The early church prayed and prayed and prayed. And you know that the church in the 21st century ought to look like the church in the first century in all kinds of ways, but maybe one of the biggest, we ought to pray. Prayer connects us to God in extraordinary ways. He connects us, prayer connects us to God in unexpected ways. And I think the story in the book of Acts in chapter 12, it teaches us four different connections that prayer makes with our God. Again, I hope you have your Bibles and I hope they're open to Acts chapter 12. We're going to walk, walk our way through this section of scripture and think about these four connections. Connection number one is that pr prayer connects us to peace. Prayer connects us to peace. Let's look at the first seven verses here in Acts chapter 12. This is what God's word says. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the, the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, get up quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. Uh, this amazing miracle happens in the first seven verses here of, of Acts chapter 12. Peter is, is freed from prison. The, the chains fall off, the gates open up, and Peter's going to be let out. Uh, it is, go back to verse 1, and we, we're introduced to Herod Agrippa. This is the great-grandson of, of King Herod the Great, uh, who was uh, king around the birth of Jesus. And, and uh, uh, Herod the Great was a great builder. He had amassed kind of this kingdom. And, and then after his death, it was all split up and divided. And finally, you get to Agrippa, who had grown up in the imperial palace in Rome. And so he had connections back there. He was friends with with the emperors. He was he was buddy buddy and he had he was a great politician. He kept them happy and they kept giving him back pieces of his grandfather's kingdom. And by this time the, the kingdom had been restored. He had all this area back in including Jerusalem and, and uh, he, it, one of the ways that he kept the folks in Jerusalem happy is that he arrested some of the apostles and we read about here in Acts chapter 12 he arrested James and had him beheaded and, and the beheading was saved for, for uh, uh, somebody who had walked away from the faith and so this really rallied the troops so to speak. They were excited about this, so excited about it that he goes out and he arrests Peter too and, and the the plan is the same thing. We're going we're gonna to arrest Peter. I'm going to put him in prison. It's Passover, so we'll wait till the, the feast is over, and then we'll have a trial, and we know how the trial will end. Peter will be guilty, and when Peter is found guilty, we'll execute him. And so this, this is where Peter is at as he waits in prison for his execution. And Herod has four squads. He's got four soldiers watching him 24-7. So there's four different squads of four soldiers surrounding Peter as he sleeps on sort of three-hour shifts. They're just over and over and over again. He, he wants to make sure that this guy is there. And Peter is just left in prison. We get to verse 5, and it's this, this uh, sentence that in, in the Greek, it, it would be like, on, on one hand, this is going on, but on the other hand, this is happening. 
And, and so I, on one hand, this is really kind of bad news. So Peter was kept in prison. On the other hand, man, watch out. Watch out because something good is happening over here. The church is earnestly praying for Peter. This word earnest, earnestly, is, a, is an interesting Greek word. It only shows up a, a few times in the New Testament. The most famous passage when we find it is in Luke's gospel. When Luke is telling us about, about Jesus going into the garden the night he's betrayed. You remember he's about ready to go to the cross and he goes into the garden. How does scripture describe the way Jesus prayed? Is it, Jesus is praying so hard in the garden that he's sweating blood. And that is earnest prayer. There's a little, it's a little ironic, by the way, that this is one of those occasions when Jesus has the 12 with them, and then he says, I'm going to go pray, you guys stay here and pray, and then he takes the, the three, you know, James, John, and Peter, he said, come a little further, and then they pray, and he said, you guys stop here and pray, and then Jesus goes on to pray, he's sweating blood, he comes back to find Peter sleeping again. Right, and as the church is off earnestly praying, Peter is sleeping. <laughs> this earnest prayer where Jesus you know, prays so, so hard that he's sweating blood. The Greek word literally means to stretch out your hand. It's this idea of, you know, we might, we might say, oh, well, you, you want to you try something that's outside your comfort zone. Maybe you need to, you, you know, if, if, if you're an athlete, you want to run a little further the next day. You want to stretch yourself to go beyond what you've experienced before. That's the idea, that this, this prayer is stretching them, that it's growing them. They, they're meeting together in earnest prayer. I don't know. I, I, we have to figure out how to be about this. The Apostle Paul and his letters were reading through the summer reading program, and I would just encourage you, as you're reading through those letters that Paul writes in the New Testament, just, just keep notes, underline, circle, make some kind of mark in each one of those letters, when each one of those books, when Paul is talking about prayer. When, over and over, he says, I'm praying for you. I won't stop praying for you. I pray without ceasing. I mean, that's how Paul talks about uh, uh, this earnest prayer. Now, we, we have to figure out somehow how to in, engage God in, in prayer earnestly. Now, I told you last week that my mom loves to track us now, and she's been tracking me, and she said, oh, you're at church pretty early on Tuesdays. What are you doing there? And, and I'm reluctant. I've been reluctant to tell anybody. A long time ago, I told you that God was working on me about this fourth watch of the night, and, and that's early in the morning. And I'm like, God, leave me alone, because I, what I like to do early in the morning is sleep. You know, just stop bugging me about it. All right, but he kept bugging me about it, and I decided, okay, okay, I, I've got to do something, and and I just want to, I just want to set aside, you know, maybe just one day a week, even, where at that fourth watch, and I'm not legalistic about it, so don't, you're know, like, Lance, you weren't there at five thirty. That's the fourth. Don't, you know, I'm. Not, but anyway, early in the morning, on Tuesdays, I just come here to to pray for our community, pray for you guys, I pray for Walula, what's going on. I, I'm working through that summer reading plan, so I, I work that soap method, and, and that's what I do on those Tuesday mornings, and it's just a little earlier than I typically do it. I just uh, be earnest in prayer. You know, I, I get there's, there's nothing special about coming here to do it, but if, if I tried to uh, pray during the fourth watch of the night at home, my pillow is right there. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. We just have to figure out how, what, what steps do we take to be earnest in prayer? You know, here the, the church gathered together. They were praying together in this, this, this house and, and uh, probably in other houses. You know, he says, uh, eventually he's going to say, go tell James and the other brothers. And, and so there are probably other believers praying in other houses. But here, this group of believers is gathered together to pray. And one of the great things going on soon here at Wallula Christian Church will be our small groups kicking off in August. You, you have some information. If you're interested in leading a group, do that. But if you've never been a part of a small group here at Wallula, you need to be, well, praying 
in thinking, in deciding, in choosing to be a part of one of those small groups this fall. I, I won't try to oversell those groups because, you, you know, you're going to come to that group and, and maybe it won't be the most fascinating Bible study you've ever been a part of. You know, maybe, maybe you'll be in a, a sermon-based small group and you're thinking, man, that sermon wasn't all that complicated on Sunday. We don't need to talk about it again. I can't promise you this extraordinary experience, right? I, I can't promise you that all your questions about Scripture and faith will be answered. But what I can promise you is that you'll meet some folks that care about you, that you have this opportunity to develop relationships that really matter, that you have this chance. And this is one of the big reasons that our small groups are important. You have this chance to pray with other believers. I, I get it that sometimes it's really awkward and you're not sure what to do or how to act or what to say. But man, just stretch your hand out. Get started. Find this way to earnestly engage our God, to pray with others. Go through this summer Bible reading plan and work that soap method, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Spend time every day consistently with God. You know, I, I pray with a, a few guys every Sunday at 8 o'clock before our worship service. I, I have in my notes say, you know, we're down. Dave Coleman, our friend who's off to Honduras to serve as a missionary in Honduras, he was a, a part of that group all the time on Sunday morning. And I have in my notes, look, we're down one guy, so, you know, come on out. And it doesn't, doesn't have to be a guy, but come on out and pray. Right, 8 o'clock Sunday mornings, we would love to have you. We just meet in this classroom down the hallway here, and we, we just pray for what's going on that day. You know, I, I have my notes to say that, and then we're sitting down to pray at 8 o'clock, and you know, one of the guys in that room gets a text message from Dave Coleman. I'm praying for Wallula, praying for you guys. Sort of humbling, we're not really down a guy. <laughs> But at 8 o'clock, find a way to earnestly be praying for what's going on in your life, for what's going on in, in your, your friends, your family, uh, believers around you. Stay connected to God. It, it connects us to peace. Prayer does. You know, I said that this, Peter is sleeping. He's in prison, shackled to two armed soldiers. He's got other guys looking at him with their spears and swords and like, don't move or else you might lose a limb. And he's just snoozing away. <laughs> what? Why? Why could this guy be filled with such peace? I think he knew that his God loves him in an extraordinary way. Oh, by the way, I think Peter was absolutely aware. He knew what happened to James. And I think he, I, he was not so dumb that he couldn't figure that's like, likely the outcome in my situation. This, last week, I had to go to a funeral of one of my friends from college. And I, I shared this story at that funeral. And I, I just t said that, you know, there's, there's a, more than one miracle in this story. Right, the, the obvious miracle that we all point at. Well, what's the miracle in Acts chapter 12? Peter's freed from prison. This angel walks him out of prison. He just walks out. It's a miracle. But we miss one of the, the biggest miracles here. And it's way back at the beginning of the chapter. And it just says, he killed James, the brother of John. Now you say, Lance... What in the world are you talking about? How can that be a miracle? Well, I go back to a conversation that Jesus had with his buddies when he said, look, this is about to go down and I'm going away, meaning I'm going to die. And when I do, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And why would I go and prepare a place for you if I'm not coming back for you again? 
That's the promise that Jesus made to those 12 disciples, and it's the promise that he's made to every single one of you. When we say yes to Jesus, we can be secure. We can absolutely trust him that he is getting ready for us a room in his father's house. And that this, the beginning of the story that we said, oh, it begins in such a sad way, is really a miracle. James, in that moment, when Agrippa thought, I won, and people are applauding me, there's angels celebrating in heaven. As James is welcomed into the presence of Jesus. That funeral, I said, look, my friend Mark, some of you met Mark at our bomb Christmas party this last year. He came to our, our Christmas party. He was going through a rough time, but I thought, man, he looks, he looks better, healthier than he's looked in a long time. And it was just shortly after that that he went in the hospital and he never came out. He died several weeks ago. And while Mark was in that hospital, you know what his friends and family and other believers did? Man, we prayed earnestly. God, help Mark recover. Restore his health. He's got two little kids, another son who just graduated high school. We, we need him to come out, walk out of that hospital. And I have no idea. I'm not smart enough to know. I can't explain why Mark's story ended more like James than like Peter's. But I do know this, that we can absolutely be at peace, that Mark or any of our loved ones who have gone before us are in the presence of Jesus when they rest in that relationship with him. This is the peace that prayer and a relationship with Jesus connects us to. It's connection number one. Connection number two is that prayer connects us to God's direction. Look at verses 8 through 11 here in, in Acts chapter uh, 12. And, and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And we went out and he followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. Well, duh, Peter, from the hand of Herod and from all that Jewish people were, were expecting. And it's just a, again, the amazing story continues. And, and it starts with Peter sleeping in prison and the angel of the Lord. There's that phrase again. It's, it's an interesting phrase. It shows up like 50 times in the Old Testament, 11 times in the New Testament. It, it's occurred in Acts chapter 5 and in Acts chapter 8, and now again in Acts chapter 12. And whenever you read the angel of the Lord, you should think, well, God's presence is there. It's as if God is directly working in the situation. And here he is waking Peter up, and Peter is, is so foggy or whatever, he's not sure what to do, and the angel literally takes his hand. Now put on your sandals, Peter. Now put on your cloak, Peter. Peter, let's stand up. We've got places to go. And then he walks them out of the prison through the doors that open of their own accord. Man, I don't know if, if you're like me, but there are days when I wish there was just an angel holding my hand saying, Lance, now I need you to put on your shoes. I'd like you to put some pants on now, Lance. Let's go. Come on out. Take these steps. This is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. Uh, I, I don't know as if that's how it works. We, we have this real gift of the Holy Spirit living inside us, and he guides us and nudges us, and we've got to stay in tune to that. We have the, God's word that we can open up and read and understand, and it directs our paths and tells us you know, how we ought to act and where we ought to go and how we ought to live and all those things. But man, there are days when I wish just an angel would hit me with a stick. Do this, dummy. 
right, and follow after me. There, there are seasons in life when, when I have just felt stuck and I wasn't sure what to do next. And maybe you're in one of those spots. And, and I guess in, in regards to your relationship to Jesus, like you're in that spot and you're in the relationship that's kind of crumbling and you don't know what to do about it. You, the job has gone away and you don't know where to, what to do. You just graduated high school and you're not sure where am I going to go or what school or that's coming up and I don't know what to do next with my life and all those things and you're wondering what in the world do I do next and why isn't God just saying, do this, dummy? I'm not sure uh, what I can tell you to do, but I do know this. Peter gives us the example. He just put on his sandals, and he put on his coat, and he got up, and he followed whatever direction he had. And the, the, <laughs> the best advice I can tell you is if you just feel like God isn't talking to me, I can't hear from him, you cannot afford to do nothing. Nothing. You cannot afford to just stay in the bed. You've got to get up and put on the sandals and put on the cloak. And you've got to open his word. You've got to show up to worship. You've got to be a part of the group. You've got to find a place to serve. And you might be saying, I don't know if this is really where I'm gifted or how God can use me. You can't afford to do nothing. Just keep going. That's what Peter did. He just kept going. And it wasn't until he was down the road that he realized, I'm out of jail. This is real. It's not a dream. It's not a vision. God has rescued me. Folks, know. Know that God loves you in a big, big way. And I can't promise that that next step of faith that you're not sure you ought to take is the, is the absolute answer to your problems or your situation or where you ought to be. But I do know that God will honor it and that he loves you and that he's already rescued you. That no matter what the miracle looks like at the end of our life, he's rescued you. We can be connected to his direction. That's connection number two. Connection number three is that prayer connects us to one another. Let's look at verses 12 through 16 because here we get to the prayer meeting. This is my favorite part, maybe. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary. Peter just said, I've, I've got to go where I know folks will be uh, uh, gathered. And so he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And, and when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And so they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. When they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Prayer connects us to one another. Uh, here, we just get this example. When you're not sure what to do, Peter's in jail. They're not sure what to do. James has just been beheaded. What do we do next? They gathered together to pray. Be together with other believers. Find time to fellowship, to be together, to pray together. And then Peter realizes that he's free, he's out of prison, he shows up at the house, he knocks on the door, and it's like a scene from a bad sitcom. This little servant girl, Rhoda, comes to answer the door, and she's like, who's there? It's Peter, let me in. And she's like, oh, it's Peter. And she turns and runs, and she's so excited that she forgets to open the door, she leaves the fugitive outside. Good luck, Peter. And she goes to tell everybody else. And you know what those faithful followers of Jesus, those folks gathered to earnestly pray for Peter. Do you know what they tell this little girl? You crazy. That's, that's, that's the Greek. You are out of your head. My no my. My no my, you're out of your head. Man, Rhoda is in great company, by the way. You know the other people in Scripture that are described as my no my? Well, it's Jesus in John chapter 10, 
Jesus is preaching and healing people, and, and then these religious leaders, they gather around and they say, this guy is my no my. He must have a demon. That's the only explanation. Paul, a little later in Acts, in Acts chapter 26, he'll be, he'll be defending himself against the political leaders and sharing his story, and, and somebody will stop him and say, Paul, you're my no my. You're out of your head. You're crazy. This is beyond reason what you are saying. There's no explanation for this. I, I just wonder, what, what is the prayer that you need to be lifting up right now that maybe you've been scared to pray? Have you ever been there? And this is going on, and you are just so, you're, you're so conflicted because you, you need his help. But you're like, what if, what if the story ends more like James than Peter? What's the prayer that you need to have somebody say, you're my no my? You know, what's the, what's the step of faith? You know, these, these three folks who, who said yes to Jesus in baptism at 9 o'clock, you know, I just, I just think back to when I was a, a student pastor in Yuma, Arizona. I had this high school girl who, uh, you know, she started coming to these leadership D groups that we were doing, these small groups, and we made a big deal about it. We were like, oh, if you commit to this group, you have to be at this group. You know, you can't, you know, whatever. Don't, don't take this lightly. I don't know what we'd do if somebody didn't show up. Nothing. But that's what we said. And this young girl, she played soccer, and she was committed to that, and she decided, I'm going to be a part of this D group and leadership in this youth group, and I'm going to be baptized. So she was, and then she got involved in that, and she's like, I can't go to soccer on these nights. And her dad went kind of nuts, because, like, you're supposed to be at soccer, and what do you mean you're going to go to this prayer meeting instead? And I mean, she just said, this is the step I'm going to take. Even when others around her were saying, my no my. You know, what's the step of faith that you need to take where somebody at work is going to say, my no my, you're out of your head. You want to you wanna work with preschoolers on Sunday morning? My no my. What, you, you want to go to middle school camp? My no my. You're going to host a small group in your home? My no my. You know, what's that step of faith that you need to take, that the Holy Spirit is whispering to you right now? Connects us to, to one another. Connection number four is that prayer connects us to mission. L look at verse 17 here. Uh, it, it says, uh, verse 17, but motioning to them, so he quiets the crowd with his hand to be silent. He described to them uh, how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, tell these things to James. This is a different James, right? So we've got James, the brother of John, one of the 12 apostles. And this is James, who's involved in the leadership in the church in Jerusalem, who's the half-brother of Jesus. All right, so go tell James and the rest of the church, wherever they're praying. Then he departed and went to another place. So he takes off to protect the church and probably to, to protect himself a little bit. He hushes the crowd. He says, you got to share this with others. I, I, I love this because he, he's just, he's given, we might call this a praise report, right? Have you ever heard that? That's a very churchy way of saying it. But we, we collect these prayer requests all the time. I, I say it every Sunday. There's this welcome home card. Everybody fill that out. If you have prayer concerns, write those down. We're going to collect them and our staff's going to pray for them on Sunday and, and on Tuesdays. And that prayer list is filled with Hurts and brokenness and heartache. There's hard stuff that folks are dealing with every week. And man, we are honored to be able to pray earnestly for those requests. But once in a while, my eyes just light up. Because sometimes we skip past this step. Like, even when God, you know, we're in the hospital, we're praying, God, you know, help me recuperate and get out, and then we're out, and we're like, whoa, I got to get to work. We kind of jump past that 
thanks, God, for coming through. And so it's just sort of brilliant when you read these simple things uh, from week to week, like one week, uh, last month or so, it was my hip is not hurting anymore. Another week, giving praise to the Lord for a big answer to prayer, he is good. Another week, I'm thankful for God's faithfulness. Another week, surgery was perfect, doctor was awesome, the first treatment went great. Another week, this is our last week at Wallula. Thank you for the community this church has provided for us during our time here. Praise that we were offered a house on, on the base. Right? Just these little glimpses of God coming through. And here Peter delivers that praise report <laughs> to the church. He said, look, it's really me. God, God got me out. He rescued me. And the story flashes back right after this, and it goes back to Herod, and, and it, it, it's really kind of ugly. Herod finds out that Peter is gone, that he escaped, and he questions the soldiers, and he has them executed, and then Herod takes off. He flees, right? There's, there's all kinds of, it's interesting, when you read the scholars, they'll like, well, he had this trade war with Tyre and Sidon, and he had to go deal with this in Caesarea, and the truth is, he's a politician, and when the applause stops... He's like, I'm out of town. I think he's just embarrassed that he couldn't come through. And so he takes off for Caesarea. And when he gets to Caesarea, those, those folks that are there sucking up to him now from Ty and, and, and Sidon, and they're like, hey, we think you're really great. And he gives this speech. And then they say, man, you sound like a god. And Agrippa, it's kind of ironic because part of the reason that they loved him enough in, in Jerusalem is because he, he kept one of the emperors from putting a statue of himself in the Jewish temple. But here on this, when the applause stopped, his ego was hurting. And he said, you know, I do sound like a god. And God said, the one true god said, you're going to vomit worms and die. And that's what happened. Just an ugly end to Herod Agrippa. We flash back from Herod Agrippa to just this report about the church in verse 24 of Acts chapter 12, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Because when the church is connected to God in his power through prayer, even when persecution happens, even when hardship occurs, the church just keeps going on mission. And prayer connects us to that mission. This week, there's going to be all kinds of celebrations, and I'm all for the celebrations, right? Get together, have some hot dogs and some apple pie, and be American. That's fine, right? There's going to be fireworks. That's going to be exciting, you know, and you're going to be tempted when you're at one of those fireworks shows. You're going to be tempted to take some pictures or maybe a video, and my advice is don't. Right? Nobody wants to see your fireworks show on your phone. <laughs> All right, and truly, have you ever done that? I mean, you take the, oh man, this is amazing, this is the best fireworks show I've ever seen. I've just got some random, these are generic pictures that I found. I just, you know, you, you look at fireworks and you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. In the picture, you're like, oh yeah. But you take the video or you take the, the picture of the fireworks and you know that it's nowhere near the experience you had in person when you actually experienced the show. Man, how true is that of prayer? Right? You say, oh, way to go, you know, preacher boy. That was a, that kind of cute story. You had some fun little t stories in there, and you talked about prayer, and that's neat how it all worked out for Peter. And that's kind of how we read these stories about prayer in Scripture. But oh man, what's it like when you're connected to the creator, sustainer, redeemer of the universe just through a conversation with him? You've got to try it for yourself. Let's stand and worship him.